Okay, hello, hello, hello. Um, welcome to our webinar on avian uh, nutrition and related illnesses. Uh, <clears throat> as I'm, uh, we're going to continue to let people in uh, because we have just about maybe half or not even half of all the people who have signed up for this. So um, while we're letting people in, I'd like to go over a little bit of um, housekeeping with you as far as we will have a chat um, uh, that is open. Um, if you're on a PC, uh, please feel free to open up your chat box so you can see at least where it is. Um, and that way everyone can uh, communicate with one another throughout the chat. I mean throughout the presentation. We also have a question and answer uh, button up here, which is next to um, that you can um, press to a uh, for any specific questions that you'd like to an have Dr. McNaughty answer. Um, and what we will do is we will be doing uh, the, the Q&A's at the end of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so um, who, who am I, right? <laughs> I'm Wendy Whitesides. I'm the Director of Education here at Companion Parents Rehomed. Um, what we do at Companion Parents Rehomed is we are a um, rehoming agency. Basically, uh, what we do, we're like the Humane Society for exotic animals, uh, for exotic birds. Let me rephrase that, because otherwise we'd be dealing with snakes and lizards and all that stuff, which that's uh, beyond our realm of expertise. So um, what we do is that we take um, we find new homes for uh, parents that are, are. Can you flip to the next slide for me, Jess? Oh, of course I can. <laughs> oh, sorry sure. about that. Yeah, no worries. That helps me a little bit to have yeah. that. So we accept companion parents from unwanted emergency crisis situations throughout the greater north, south, basically the east coast of the United States. A lot of, lot of these, um, these uh, animals come to us for us to facilitate through training and education, which I'm a big one on education, new adaptive homes for these sensitive and highly intelligent creatures. So uh, this is one of the things that we do, and I am so psyched to have our guest speaker here with us today. This is Dr. Jess Spignati. Mm -hmm. I have known Jess uh, for many years. Um, let me give you a little bit of a background on her. She earned her bachelor's um, in microbiology from George Mason University. Then she went to Virginia Tech and graduated um, with in veterinary medicine and she's currently practicing uh, doing her senior residency at Stahl Exotic Animals Veterinary Services. Um, what Dr. McNaughty has completed a lot of different um, residencies or internships throughout um, many uh, avian, um, ex uh, avian practices throughout the um, United States with uh, being uh, she was did a, a, um, a, a bit at um, <clears throat> Dr. Powers uh, office and that's how I got to know her. Um, she has special interest in surgery, pathology, avian medicine. And what's neat about um, Dr. Jess is she has many exotic animals um, living with her. Um, she's got four parrots, an elderly, severe macaw, belligerent blue conyers, two mischievous green cheek conyers. She has has reptiles, um, those cute little turtles, and even a hissing cockroach. Blech. Anyway, um, but how I got to know um, Dr. Liz Jess is that she um, she came and she took one of our food classes, <laughs> and so I I when she started to. Um, in the practice, I was like, hey, can you come talk with us sometime? What is your passion? And 
So here we have it, avian nutrition and related illnesses, how to give your bird the best and prevent the worst. So I'm turning it over to Dr. Jessica McNally. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wendy, for that introduction. And thank you and Anjana both. Um, both of these wonderful women helped me with preparation of the of this presentation and just the IT stuff, the behind the scenes. Um, so I want to thank them. And I also want to thank Companion Parrots Rehomed, this wonderful organization that helps parrots um, find homes who are homeless. Um, they also are really big in education, hold classes. As Wendy said, years ago when I first met them, I took their education work workshop on, um, it was a food workshop, how to prepare food at home for your birds. And um, I was just so, so impressed, um, you know, with the way they care for the birds at this rescue and, um, you know, everything that they do there. Um, so for this talk today, um, I've got a little outline here just going over um, the topics we're going to address. Um, as Wendy mentioned, nutrition is one of my favorite topics, especially avian nutrition. Um, I've had birds most of my life and, you know, I started out with little budgies and um, years ago, you know, went through the whole gamut of, you know, the typical things bird owners go through. You go to the pet store, you see the seed on the bag and it says it's for birds and you think it's good and before you know it, you're finding out seed isn't the best thing for these guys and so I, I've been there I've been in a lot of your shoes before for a lot of my life and um, I'm just very passionate about sharing what I've learned and how to give these you know wonderful little creatures the best that they deserve um, so the outline for today's talk, we're going to start with nutrition related illness, um, going over some of the more common things that I see um, regularly almost every day in practice when I'm working with these guys. Um, we're also going to talk about what should you feed your bird, some species specific differences, uh, a little bit on how to how to teach your bird how to forage. Um, and at the very end, we'll finish up with some fun recipes that you can cook and you can share with your bird. So we're going to start off with a couple of polls here um, just to get a little bit of information on the audience. I'd love to find out where are you watching this presentation from? And I think Wendy is going to bring the poll up in the chat um, so you can answer there. Um, I think there's a lot of different options for the responses. So um, if you could select which one fits best for you, I know in preparation for this talk, we had people kind of signing up from all over the world. So that was that was pretty exciting to see. But I'm sure, you know, there's time zone differences that, you know, maybe people can't make it to the talk. So we will be recording this and um, I think it will be posted on um, the Companion Parrots Rehomed website for anyone who wasn't able to come to the talk live. So it looks like we've got some responses here. It looks like the majority of people are from US, the Southeast region. We've got a couple from the Northeast region, um, someone in Canada, Poland. So feel free to keep posting your responses there and thank you for everyone who did respond. Um, and then our next poll we're gonna have, um, I'd like to learn a little bit about you guys and um, find out what types of birds do you have? So we've got a whole list here um, for this next poll and you can choose you know, as many um, as you, you have, but also feel free if you're noticing that the bird is not written in there, you can write down in the chat just freely you know, what type of birds you have. And I see we've got lots of people from North Carolina here. Got someone with 13 budgies. Holy moly, that's awesome. <laughs> Two cockatiels. Got African gray. All these responses coming in. This is great. We've got a lot of people with Conyers, Quakers, Senegals, and Kaiks. Seems like that's the, oh, and now the other category is uh, with Amazons, African grays, Pionis, and Jardines. So we got people with budgies, parakeets, cockatiels, others. I haven't seen anyone select the option for lovebirds, parrotlets, macaws, or cockatoos. <laughs> we got some free responses here. Macaw, Amazon, and gray, green sheet conyers, eclectus conyers. 
Someone's going to adopt budgies. Congratulations. That's so exciting. Budgies were my first bird and they will always have a special place in my heart. They're they're so teeny tiny, but they have so much personality. I think a lot of people, um, you know, miss that with them because they're so little and they're so common. But I, I, I love budgies so much. Some Amazon owners, Quaker parrots. Very cool. So this is great. It sounds like we've got people with a whole bunch of different types of birds. Um, just to tell you guys a bit about myself, currently I have um, a severe macaw who's very old. She's about 25. I also have a blue crown conure um, and two green cheek conures. And you'll actually get to see a lot of these guys throughout my presentation. Um, I've got pictures of them, so um, I'll be sure to point them out for you. All right, so to get this talk started, First, I want to talk about why is it so difficult to find out what birds need nutritionally? Because there is so many, I'm sure you guys have noticed, there's so much opinion out there. I mean, even walking through the aisles of the pet store, you can see there's pellets and seeds and all kinds of different things. And, you know, there's options to feed, you know, chop and nuts and, and all kinds of things. And it's tough to decipher what do these birds actually need? How do we meet their nutritional needs? Um, some of the reasons it's been really tough to figure out what these birds need is because of how many birds there are in the world and every single species has their own unique requirements. So in the world, there's over 18,000 species of birds um, and about 350 species of parrots. Um, what further complicates this matter is that Many of these birds in the wild, when we go out to try to study them, they have a lot of different mixed feeding strategies that will change based on their age, the availability of food, which varies by season in the wild, um, as well as birds' reproductive status. So doing studies on bird in the, birds in the wild and trying to figure out what do these guys even eat in the wild is very difficult, let alone trying to take what we know about them eating in the wild and move it, apply it to our birds in captivity. So why can't we feed wild diets to captive birds? Um, there's a couple different reasons for this. Um, it is challenging and problematic um, because, as I mentioned, wild diets vary based on the species, season, age, and reproductive status of these birds. Um, but also many of the wild plants that these birds naturally eat um, either cannot be imported or are difficult to import um, and also may be difficult to grow in captivity. Um, in addition, wild birds fly miles and miles every single day, and our captive birds just do not fly nearly the same amount. So wild birds, um, parrots that we have in captivity and love, their wild counterparts are exercising. They're working all day long, and they're burning off all these calories so they can eat many more calories than our birds do in, in captivity. We do know that excess calories can result in fatal disease, so we don't want to necessarily feed them exactly what their counterparts are eating in the wild. Um, birds do not have nutritional wisdom. Um, this may be um, something that you're familiar with, but left to their own devices, birds will choose the highest calorie, highest fat, tastiest foods every single time. And we have multiple scientific studies to back up this, um, this finding. They found this time and time again. When you give birds the choice, they want the high fat, the high sugar, the tasty stuff. Um, so we need to address this though. How do we address this? Um, we have to carefully select which foods our birds have access to, um, and that is going to be a large part of this talk today. So what we do know is that seed-based diets are not appropriate for our companion parrots. Um, they are high in calories. There's way too many calories. Um, they're high in fat. Let's see if I can move myself here so you can read the, the bottom of that screen there. Um, but they are too high in fat. Um, they're also deficient in a lot of the minerals and vitamins that birds need. Um, so they'll have a lot of nutrient imbalances if they're eating mostly seed. And feeding a mostly seed-based diet can cause illness that is otherwise preventable. So it's really important that we don't feed these guys mostly seeds. Um, a side note, you can actually soak and sprout seed, and this can be really beneficial for your bird. You can offer this as a treat. Um, when you sprout seeds and soak them, um, basically it increases the bioavailability of the nutrients within the seed. Um, so it's a little healthier than just giving them the plain seed, you know, dry straight from the bag. 
And I'll go more into detail about that a little later. Um, but it is important to know that even when you sprout seeds, they are still seeds. So you do not want this to be the majority of their diet. Got some options listed here for things that you can try sprouting, which includes mung beans, garbanzo beans, sesame seeds, a whole bunch of different things there. So nutrition related illness. Um, I'm going to go over the more common things that I see in practice um, that affect birds, um, and these include obesity, feather damaging behavior. I do want to add that feather damaging behavior um, is a multifactorial behavior, meaning it's often multiple things that cause it. It's usually not just one reason that these birds do that. Um, and in some cases, the reasons that they may be doing it might not be related to nutrition at all. Um, but sometimes it could be related to nutrition. Um, and we do know that when you encourage opportunities to forage for their food, that can actually decrease some of this behavior. So I'll go into that in a little more detail. Um, but I just want to say that, you know, feather damaging behavior is complex. Um, there's so many things that can cause it. And for the sake of this conversation, I'll just be talking about some of the nutrition, um, nutritional aspects that may or may not be related to it. Um, atherosclerosis is another one I see very commonly. That's a buildup of fat within the blood vessels of birds. Um, and then I'll also talk about vitamin and mineral deficiencies, which can lead to heart disease and liver disease. And we see this very commonly in birds feeding um, seed-based diets. So we'll start with obesity. Um, so birds, part of the problem with trying to figure out if your bird is overweight is they just don't look fat the way that you know mammals do. You look at a bird who's overweight and a bird who's underweight, and they might look exactly the same. Um, and that's because you know their feathers cover a lot of it. You can't really see things really well. Um, so the best way for you to find out if your bird is underweight or overweight is to bring them to an avian veterinarian and they'll look at a number of different factors. They'll look at um, their weight on the scale and then they'll also palpate over their keel. That's the sternum, the big bone that runs down the front of their body, the pectoral muscles on either side of the keel. Um, they'll also check them for possible subcutaneous fat. Um, and with a combination of all these different factors, they'll be able to tell you if your bird is at an appropriate way or if we need to do some adjustments. Um, so excess calories in birds, um, the problem with this is it can cause a lot of different illnesses that are preventable. Um, so one of the more common things I see is hormonal behavior. Birds, when they have excess calories in their diet, can actually contribute to an increase in hormonal behavior. And the thought is that, you know, when they're in the wild, um, there's not an abundance of food all the time. Um, there's seasonal abundances. So like in the spring and summer, you know, when a lot of these fruits and blossoms are coming into play um, and there's a ton of food, that's actually a environmental signal to birds that, hey, there's lots of food here and there's enough food for you to prepare your body to make babies and carry eggs and it's also enough food for you to feed your babies and then that triggers them to say all right it's baby making time so part of the problem with captivity is that we're, if we feed them too much we're actually signaling to them that it is baby making time and um, that certainly can cause you know a lot of the unwanted hormonal behavior that we see in them that can um, lead to you know a lot of different health issues so we really want to discourage that behavior when we can um, and reducing the amount of calories making sure there's not excess calories is a really important um, way to do that some other things that excess calories can lead to are fatty liver disease, heart disease, and atherosclerosis. So one thing that I recommend to all my clients is to get a gram scale for your bird. Um, you can get these online or in stores. Um, they usually sell it for like weighing out food when you're cooking. Um, but if you can weigh your bird on that regularly, this is going to help you track any changes that could alert you to potential underlying illness. Again, because birds don't show when they're underweight or overweight, they can kind of look very similar if you're just looking at them. Um, by weighing them, you can actually watch the numbers and see, are they starting to lose weight? Are they gaining weight? What's going on? Um, I would recommend not weighing them 
every single day because it's easy to drive yourself crazy with the little fluctuations. Uh, just like people, birds are going to change in weight from a day to day basis. Um, but may, maybe a couple times a week checking their weight. Um, and ideally, you want to check their weight at the same time every day. The best time is to check it first thing in the morning. You know, ideally right after they've had that really big morning poop. You know, most birds will they'll hold their poop in their cage overnight sometimes. And then as soon as they're out, they'll drop it, you know, first thing in the morning so you can check their weight then um, and that will give you a more consistent measurement. Um, if your bird won't willingly stand on the scale, one little trick you can use is actually put them first in their carrier and then put the carrier on the scale and then subtract the weight of the, the carrier from the scale to get your bird's weight. So it's very, very important that when you're addressing obesity, you know, or any um, diet related thing in your bird that you work closely with your avian vet to determine a safe solution for weight loss. Um, you don't want to change their diet suddenly um, because birds, unfortunately, will be very stubborn sometimes and they will actually starve themselves sometimes if they don't like the food you're offering. Um, so very important that you track their weight regularly when changing their diet and that you work closely with with your avian veterinarian. Um, so as I said, you can monitor their weight when changing their diet to track any concerning changes. A good rule of thumb is if your bird is losing more than 10% of its body weight in a short period of time, that is concerning. That is not something that we want. That is too much weight loss too soon. Um, so that's where weighing your bird, you know, every few days or so can really come into play. All right, now we are up to another poll. Um, so this poll is a little bit of a quiz. I want to see uh, who is paying attention. And um, so we've got why is a diet based in seeds unhealthy for birds? And there's a few different options here. It's is it because there's excess fat, excess calories, missing essential minerals and vitamins, or is it all of the above? And I'll give you guys a few minutes to get your answers in. I can I already see here, it looks like you guys are sharp. You're on top of this. I am so impressed. This 100% of you are getting this absolutely right. Yep, you got it. It's all of the above. Um, so just remember that, you know, these are, these are all reasons why it's just not good to feed your bird seeds as the majority of their diet. Uh, fantastic. Awesome. I am so impressed. <laughs> all right. So now we're going to talk about feather damaging behavior as it relates to nutritional illness. Again, I want to emphasize that feather damaging behavior, it is complex and it's often multifactorial and it's not something that is easily addressed. Um, so it's very important that if your bird is doing this, you work closely with your avian vet to figure out why your bird is doing this or how we can better help your bird and to not do this behavior. Um, but I'm going to go over some nutrition related components that when addressed could potentially reduce this behavior. Um, so this was actually really cool. This was a study they did um, in birds where they looked at birds with feather damaging behavior and they gave them, they set them into two different groups and one group of feather damaging birds they had in an environment that was not very physically complex and they did not really provide foraging opportunities. Um, and then the birds, the other group of birds, they did provide foraging opportunities and it was a more complex environment. And the really exciting thing is they actually found that when birds were offered a more physically complex environment with opportunities to forage, forage meaning um, search and hunt and gather and work for their food rather than just having it in a bowl every day, the birds who were working for their food actually had a reduction, a significant, clinically significant reduction in the amount of time spent damaging their feathers. And these birds overall had um, feathers that were in healthier condition. So this was really exciting because what this study showed is that basically it proved when you give your bird opportunities to forage and you teach them, because birds have to be taught how to forage, they don't intuitively know how, um, you can actually reduce the amount of time that they spend damaging their feathers. Um, it's not a cure-all, you know, it's not going to guarantee totally stop this behavior, but it could help and allowing your bird to forage is an essential part of keeping parrots in captivity. 
Um, some other things that research has shown, um, birds can have vitamin A deficiency. This is common when birds are eating mostly seed. Um, vitamin A deficiency can result in dry skin and poor feather quality, which could worsen feather destructive behavior. Um, deficiencies in many other nutrients have been found to potentially play a role in causing dry skin in birds, um, which could lead to an increase in feather damaging behavior. Um, so very important that, you know, we're meeting your bird's nutritional needs, um, and I'll go over exactly how to do that in just a little bit. So atherosclerosis is another common nutrition related illness that I see. Um, atherosclerosis is the buildup of fats, cholesterol and other substances in the arteries. The buildup is called plaque and plaque can cause arteries to narrow, blocking the blood flow. This is very common, unfortunately, in parrots in captivity. Um, it is often related to their diet. So if they're eating a lot of high calorie, high fat, high cholesterol diets, we especially see this when birds are eating a lot of seeds and nuts. Um, excess calories, however, you should know they can come in the form of anything. It's not just about eating a lot of fat. If your bird's eating a lot of carbs, a lot of protein, or a lot of fat, any of those macronutrients, too much of any of those is a bad thing and could contribute to atherosclerosis. Um, fruits in general contain some sugar, um, and there are some fruits that have sugar in higher amounts than others. In general, apples, grapes, and bananas have a higher amount of calories and sugar than other fruits, so you do not want to be feeding these um, fruits in large quantities. So apples, grapes, bananas, just remember those three, um, and oftentimes these are the ones that birds love. You know, you may notice that, well, those are my bird's favorite fruits, you know, and the reason for that is they're tasty. They've got a lot of sugar in them, the birds like them, but they are not very good for them. So you want to make sure that if you're feeding these fruits at all, it should be in a very, very small amount. Right. Um, so as far as atherosclerosis goes, there are risk factors that can increase the likelihood that your bird can get this illness. Um, so it's not just about diet, but diet can be part of it. Um, age has been found to be a risk factor. Birds greater than 20 years have been found to be more likely or at increased risk of developing it. Um, females more than male birds, and that has to do with the lipid metabolism of females, especially when they're reproductively active. Species, there are some species that are actually predisposed or at higher risk of getting atherosclerosis. Um, we do see a higher incidence in African greys, Amazon parrots, and cockatiels. If your bird has reproductive disease or liver disease, they are also at increased risk of developing this. And if they are eating a high fat or high calorie diet, that is another risk factor. Currently, atherosclerosis is a disease that's managed. We can't cure it. So really our best ammunition against this illness is to try to prevent it in the first place. Um, and the way that we can try to prevent it um, and management, one of the ways is actually with supplementation of omega-3s. So omega-3s are a type of fat, fatty acid, they're a nutrient, um, and you can supplement these for your birds. And um, basically a study, so several studies actually, they've, they've done a lot of research on this topic, um, have found that omega-3s were correlated with reduced severity of atherosclerosis when given to birds. Um, fatty acids have also been found to reduce inflammation and have renal protective effects, renal meaning the kidneys, so these can help with kidney function. Um, and then omega-3s have also been associated with um, a reduction in fat and cholesterol, um, which could help prevent atherosclerosis, liver disease, heart disease, a whole bunch of things. So where do you find omega-3 fatty acids, right? Um, you can find these in a lot of places. There is one specific supplement that I know of that's actually been formulated and um, tested in clinical trials to be effective for birds. Um, and that product's called Vet Omega. You can get that from your bird vet. Um, there's a lot of different omega-3 supplements though in stores that are made for people or other animals. And I would just caution you with use of those in your birds because they, are not necessarily, we don't know if those are going to be effective in birds. Um, you know, the studies have been done 
for products and people, you know, for people and other animals for other animals. So ideally it's best to get them one that's made specifically for birds. And again, the, the only one that I'm aware of is the Vet Omega. Um, there are also natural foods um, that are high in omega-3s. That includes flaxseed and walnuts. Um, so you can feed them those and that can help boost their omega-3s. There's also some pellets that are fortified with omega-3s. Um, so that's another way to provide that for your bird. All right, here we go with another poll. So this is a true or false question. Um, so true or false. It's okay to feed a lot of apples, grapes, and bananas because they are natural, so they must be good for birds. And I'll give you guys a, a few minutes to, to answer that. Yep, boom, you guys are on it. I love this, this is a very sharp audience. Um, so yep, very impressed, false, absolutely false. Yep, we wanna make sure those are the ones we do not wanna feed in large amounts because they have a lot of sugar. Um, and Nina asked, how about other fruits? So there are actually, that's a great question because there are fruits that are really good for these guys. Um, and I'll certainly be going into the ones that we can feed um, and I'll go into the exact, you know, amounts and that sort of thing in just a little bit. So very good question though. All right, um, and then the last part of the nutrition related illness that I wanna talk about is vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Now these I also see sadly somewhat commonly in birds. Um, and it's often, you know, when their their diet just isn't appropriate for them. Um, a note that I wanted to address about vitamin supplementation, um, it's not currently recommended based on what we know, based on what's published, um, you know, in the peer reviewed journals um, on avian nutrition. It's just not a good idea to supplement vitamins in the food or water um, for various various number of reasons. One is, what, is that vitamins can actually encourage bacterial growth when they're put in their water. Um, supplementing water could lead to avoidance of water. If your bird just doesn't like the taste of whatever you're putting in the water, they might avoid it. And it doesn't mean that they'll you know, completely avoid it, but maybe they're not drinking as much as they would if that supplement wasn't in there. Um, and that could lead to chronic dehydration, which can result in a lot of different illnesses. So best not to do that. Um, and then some other reasons that we don't wanna supplement um, is, Birds will consume various amounts of um, their food and their water from a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and if they have too much at any one point, they actually can have toxicosis. They can have toxic effects if they get too much of one vitamin. Um, and then also water-soluble vitamins break down easily in water, so they may not be effective. Um, you may see some um, seeds sold in pet stores that say they're fortified with vitamins on the shell. Um, but the problem with that is that birds don't eat the shell of seeds. They actually hull it, you know, they get rid of the shell, they crack it, they eat the insides and they toss the shell. So if the shell is dusted in whatever it's dusted in, it doesn't matter, the bird's not gonna be eating the shell, so that's not gonna help them. Um, so mostly seed diets. Um, these, as we said, they lead to vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Um, excess fat and calories in the seed diets can lead to heart disease, liver disease, and other conditions. Heart disease and liver disease are caused by nutrition. They can be caused by nutritional deficiencies, um, and they can also be fatal. Um, heart disease and liver disease are things that are not typically cured but managed. Um, so prevention is really our best way to help our birds. So how do we prevent nutritional illness in birds? Um, and this is this is the good stuff. So the main thing that you want to do is feed a bird a diet that meets the current recommendations based on the most up-to-date literature and scientific studies. There is a ton of stuff out there and not all of it is backed um, by peer-reviewed literature. People can make any claims they want, as I'm sure you're aware, and say something does something, but if it's not backed by science and by clinical studies, it's I caution you to take it with a grain of salt. Um, so be wary of opinion-based recommendations that don't have scientific evidence to support those claims. Um, current diet recommendations. Now this is according to the literature. So this is based off of 
you know, many, many years of studies, decades of studies in birds, um, and the most current recommendations that are in the literature um, are to offer commercial pellets as 60 to 80 percent of the diet, the remainder of the diet as produce, seeds and nuts as treats, if at all. Now, it is important to know that this is a general recommendation. This might not be appropriate for your bird, and really for the best nutritional advice, you should contact your avian vet because um, this may differ um, for your bird. So they did a study on a mixture of seeds, produce, and pellets and Amazons. This was a really cool study where they were trying to see OK, how much of each of these do we have to feed our birds to make sure that we're meeting the nutrient requirements? We're not feeding them too much. Um, and they had three different categories that they offered to birds. So they had one category where they fed them 25% pellets, 50% produce, and 25% seed. In that category, those birds ate diets um, that were actually they found to be deficient in calcium, sodium, and iron, and contained more than the recommended amount of fat. The next group they looked at were um, they were offered a diet of 60% pellets, 22% produce, and 18% seed. And in this group, they consumed diets with more fat than recommended, but they did have acceptable levels of calcium and all other nutrients measured. The third category, they offered the birds 75% pellets and 25% produce. Um, and they found that these birds actually consumed diets that were within the recommendations for nearly all measured nutrients. So what is the take home there? The take home is that diets that were fed consisting of more than 10% seeds did lead to excess fat levels. And we know excess fat levels are not good. Um, they can cause all those you know, various issues that I mentioned earlier, the various illnesses. Um, diets that consisted of more than 20% seed led to nutrient deficiencies in essential vitamins and minerals, and that can also cause a lot of disease in birds. So really, take home is that seed should not be more than 10% of your bird's diet. Pellets and produce should make up the majority of their diet. And this is just based off of, you know, a lot of research and everything that we found thus far. Um, I can one thing I can guarantee is that that is probably going to change in the future as we have more studies and we're learning more because, you know, there is always more to be learned. Um, you know, nothing is the end all be all. But as of right now, that's what the most up to date literature is telling us. So the senior bird. Um, Let's see. Oh, I got some questions here. This is good. Several avian vets told me that budgies are different. They need more seeds. Um, kind of. So we'll address that in a little bit. And then another question, does produce include fruits? Yes, it does. And um, does that official recommendation of diet um, 60 to 80 percent commercial pellets include pellets that are high in sugar? That is an interesting question. That's a really good question. And we'll address that in just a little bit. Um, and we'll I'll try to go through most of these questions at the end as well, just because I know we're limited on time today. So there is little research on the nutritional needs of geriatric citizen birds. Citizen is just the fancy word for parrot. Um, but in general, it's best to feed these guys low fat formulated diets and antioxidant fresh veggies and fruits that will provide the necessary nutrients. Diets that are rich in omega-3 and 6 fatty acids might help slow down degenerative processes such as cataracts, osteoarthritis, and atherosclerosis. Those are all things that senior birds are more likely to get than younger birds, um, so you can consider supplementing with that. What to avoid? You don't want to feed your bird avocado. That is toxic to birds. Just don't want to feed it. Um, you want to avoid grapes, bananas, and apples. Those are high in sugar. Birds love them, but they're not ideal. Avoid a high amount of fruits in general, and I'll go into more detail about what that means, which fruits are good, which ones to avoid, that sort of thing. Um, and then ideally, you want to avoid feeding peanuts because they can carry disease-causing fungus. All right, um, so poll time. Here we go with another poll, and this is just for me to try to get to know you guys better and what you're used to for your birds. So this question, how often do you prepare food for your bird? This isn't about, you know, how much should you do, or this isn't a judgment at all, but just for me to kind of get to know um, how often, you know, are people making food for your bird? So this is like, you know, going out every morning and making, you know, salad or whatever it is, chop, mash, um, you know, anything outside of just the prepackaged things that some people feed their birds. 
Oh, this is great. Awesome. OK, so these are fantastic. I'm seeing a lot of dailies in here, a little bit of weekly and monthly. That's good. Daily fresh veggies and sprouts. A large chop every month and freeze in batches. Yep, yep, absolutely. You can do that. So these are all awesome. I am so glad everyone is putting so much effort into your birds, your birds health, because that's, you know, that's absolutely one of the best things you can do for them. Hmm. All right. So what can you feed? Um, for those of you in North Carolina or who have visited Companion Parrots Rehomes, you might recognize this little birdie, this little blue and gold is uh, Bosley. He lives there and this was, I took this picture when I was doing their food workshop when I spent some time down there. Um, so what can you feed? You can feed them all kinds of stuff. Um, for the veggies, you can do jalapeno peppers, bell peppers, banana peppers. Um, in fact, jalapenos are actually one of my bird's favorites. They really enjoy them. Um, but there's so many things listed there that you can feed them. For dark leafy greens, um, you can do kale, collard greens, mustard greens. Um, for the herbs and flowers, this part's kind of fun. So you can give these guys dill, basil, chives, cilantro. Um, and I actually get for my birds um, whole bags you can buy of like organic chamomile, calendula, or hibiscus. Um, I'd recommend getting organic just so there's no pesticides in there. And um, you can feed that to them. Um, I find a lot of birds really enjoy just kind of digging through and even if they're not eating it, just kind of playing with some of those dried flowers. Here are some other things that you can feed. So for people who are um, asking about, um, and I am getting a lot of questions. These are all really good. Just since we're kind of low on time, I'll wait until the very end if that's okay. Um, but so what can you feed? You can feed birds berries, um, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries. Um, those are all pretty healthy. Um, the other fruits you can give them are figs, kiwi, pomegranate. I find a lot of birds love and they love really chewing at like the little beads inside the pomegranate, picking them apart. Um, persimmons, mango, lychee, cactus fruit, passion fruit. Um, you can also give them beans and legumes, peas, snap peas, snow peas. All of these are good things. Um, nuts, you can feed them nuts. You just want it to be a you know smaller portion of the diet, really like as a treat, just ideally less than 10% of the total. Um, so some nuts include walnuts, almonds, pine nuts, macadamia nuts, hazelnuts, and Brazil nuts. Um, here's one of my birds, Kiwi, enjoying a little jalapeno pepper slice there. Um, so you can also feed them whole grain, either cooked or uncooked whole grain. You can do spelt, oat groats, barley, steel cut oats, wheat berry, buckwheat, millet, flaxseed, chia seed, hemp seed, um, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, this is just a picture of some of the veggies that I was making for my birds one day and I wanted to show this just to emphasize that you really can offer them lots of different shapes and in fact birds seem to really enjoy and will actually choose food sometimes based off of the shape and the texture rather than the taste. Um, so I, I like to think of it as if um, it's kind of like toddlers when they refuse to eat their PB and J unless the crust is cut off. Birds will do that sometimes too. <laughs> they'll, they'll refuse to eat a certain food unless it's cut in this very specific way. So um, whenever offering foods to birds, it's a good idea to chop them up into all kinds of different shapes. You can run them through a cheese grater. Um, you can slice them, dice them, peel them, you know, all, all kinds of different things. This is just a picture of some of the things that I prepared for my birds, what it might look like. Um, on the right hand side is a little mixture of some cooked quinoa that I made. It's it's yellow because there's turmeric in it, um, but you can mix in all kinds of good stuff. Um, and you can also sprinkle in chia seed, hemp seed, all kinds of stuff. All right, so now we're going to chat about um, how not all parrots are created equal and some species specific differences. So here's that question someone had about budgies and cockatiels. Um, yes, we know that budgies and cockatiels, they're different than other birds. We know right now that their nutrient requirements are different than other birds. Um, so they are grassland species, you know, from Australia and they're granivores. So really they need a lower pellet content than other birds, about 50% or so. Um, but it doesn't mean that the other 50% should be seeds. Um, it just means that the other 50% should be something other than pellets. So that can be cooked food, like the cooked quinoa or other cooked grains, um, vegetables, a small amount of fruits, that sort of thing. 
Uh, Lori's, Laura Keats, Minas, and Toucans. These guys also have different nutrient requirements than other parrots, other birds. Um, they actually need a very low iron diet because these guys are susceptible to something called iron storage disease. Um, basically, the thought is that these birds um, probably evolved and developed to eat such low iron foods that they became very efficient at absorbing iron. But the problem is they became so efficient at absorbing it, they cannot stop absorbing it if there's too much of it in the food. So it's important to control the amount of iron that is in these types of birds' food. Um, and the best way to do that is by providing them a um, pelleted mix that's actually been formulated to meet their nutritional requirements and does not have too much iron in it. There's all kinds of different ones on the market, um, but that's kind of the take home there. Part of the problem with iron storage disease is that when birds, when these birds have excess iron, they'll store that iron in their liver, um, can cause liver disease, can lead to heart disease and enlargement of other organs. Um, so foods with high vitamin C content actually increase iron absorption. So it's important that when you're feeding these birds, um, you avoid foods that have high vitamin C because um, that can actually increase iron absorption. And again, this is just, this is not for all parrots. This is just for lorries, lorikeets, minas, and toucans. So eclectuses. Um, these guys are very special too. I, I love these guys a whole lot. Um, and they have a lot of different nutrient requirements than other parrots. So one of the main things that we know about them is they're uh, frugivores, which means they eat a lot of fruit. Um, so they need less pellets and more fruits and veggies than other parrots. Um, Dr. Rob Marshall is an avian veterinarian who's done a lot of work researching, you know, these guys in the wild and seeing what, you know, some of their nutrient requirements are. Um, I put his website on there for you to use as a resource. Um, unfortunately, as of right now in the literature, as far as I'm aware, there's no observational or experimental studies on the diet of captive eclectus. So we have a lot on the wild ones, but just as far as their nutritional requirements in captivity, to my knowledge, I don't think we have anything in the, in the field right now, but we're still looking and hopefully this is an area where we'll continue to grow and learn more about how to take care of these amazing birds. Um, so eclectus, it's important to know they're naturally slow eaters, very, very slow compared to other parrots, um, and they actually enjoy eating soft and mushy fruits or vegetables that they can hold in their mouth, take their time with, um, and I'll have a list of some of those on the next slide. Um, so how do you balance a diet and how do you measure the vitamins and minerals that these guys need? Um, it's very, very difficult to do so. And I certainly, you know, wouldn't expect anyone to try to do this at home, um, you know, because they're going to differ what they eat even from one day to the next. So the best way that you can ensure that these guys are getting the vitamins and minerals they need is to make sure that part of their diet is pellets, not the majority, but just that they're getting some in there to meet those requirements. So here is a list of all kinds of different things that you can feed to eclectus that they um, they tend to enjoy eating. A lot of these are kind of the softer foods. Um, this was um, actually I'd taken off of um, Dr. Marshall's website that I have listed there. So these are some options for you to feed if you have an eclectus. So as far as species specific differences go, there's hundreds of parrots in captivity, hundreds of species of parrots, and each of them has their own unique requirements. Um, so really the best thing you can do for your bird is consult with your avian veterinarian to find out what is best for their unique needs. So food based enrichment. Um, this is going to be a fun part. So now we're going to talk about foraging and um, hopefully y'all are familiar with foraging, but in case you're not, foraging is the act of searching for and gathering food. So parrots in the wild will spend up to 70% of their day foraging and there's a lot of thought that some of the unwanted behavioral issues we have with birds like aggression, screaming, um, even potentially feather destructive behavior might have to do with birds not being given the opportunity to forage in captivity. Um, there's that study, you know, I mentioned earlier that showed a reduction in feather destructive behavior when birds were given the opportunity to forage. Um, so, you know, how long does your bird forage? And, you know, you don't have to answer that, but just something to kind of think about. Um, 
there was a study done that showed when you offer seeds, it does not alleviate this concern. Um, there was no difference in the time spent foraging when offered seed versus pellets. So um, you might think that, you know, if a bird has, um, you know, seeds, they're chewing on it, they're getting the shell off the seed, but it doesn't, you know, actually change any of the time spent foraging. Food-based enrichment. So pellet size matters. A uh, study found that larger pellets increase the time spent foraging and feeding. Um, so this was a neat study where they looked at a orange wing Amazon colony and they offered these guys the choice of getting normal size pellets or larger than the average size pellet. And what they found was that these guys were highly motivated to seek out the larger pellets um, and they really wanted to go for the larger pellets overall besides, you know, when given the option. Um, they had a couple of little things the birds had to do to get access to the larger pellets. And part of it was they had to lift something that was very heavy. It was one and a half times the bird's body weight just to gain access to the larger pellets. Um, so these birds were all about that. They really wanted to go work for their food, go get those large pellets. Um, and another thing that they talked about in the study was that they found they're highly motivated to work for food that encourages photomandibulation. Podomandibulation is a fancy word that just podo means foot. Mandibulation is, you know, to chew. So when they're holding things in their feet and chewing them, um, that's a natural behavior that we see in a lot of parrot species in the wild. Um, and we find in captivity, they're highly motivated. At least this study found they were highly motivated to seek out food that allowed them to do this natural behavior. So how to forage? How does a bird learn how to forage? Birds are not born knowing how to do this. You have to teach them. So they're not going to intuitively know if you hang up a pretty little expensive foraging toy from the pet store. Um, you know, they're going to look at it and be like, what the heck is this? <laughs> how do I do anything with this? Um, and the most common reason I hear people give up on foraging is they say, my bird just doesn't care. They don't want to play with toys. They don't like foraging toys. I spent all this money. I got all these fancy things and they ignore them. And that is what you don't want to do. So don't give up before, you know, before you teach your bird because they have to be shown and taught how to engage with these items in order to get their treat. And oftentimes when you're first teaching a bird how to forage, you have to incorporate high value treats. So those are things like seeds, nuts, um, fruit, things that, you know, your bird really enjoys. You can totally also use vegetables or pellets if your bird really likes those. Um, but when you're first teaching them how to forage, you want to make it worth their while because they're going to put in some effort. It's going to be uncomfortable for them learning a new thing. So you want to, you know, pay them well <laughs> for it. Um, so studies have shown an increase in time spent foraging um, can decrease feather picking behavior. So that's another benefit, another reason to do it. Um, and you can see here my two green cheek conures, kiwi in the forefront is all about this little foraging treat. I just kind of wrapped up a little treat in some newspaper and he's getting into it. Whereas Navi, the one in the background, is staring at this like, what do I do with this piece of trash? <laughs> it will take him a little bit of time. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually show them the treat that I've made them, the little toy, and I'll open it up and I'll demonstrate how to go through that foraging device to get access to the food. And then I'll close it back up and then I'll offer it again and that way you're teaching your bird here's how you work for this item you can get really creative and have a lot of fun with this um, so you can weave food through the bars of the cage you can use clips to attach food to different areas you can place multiple feeding stations around you can you know really just have a lot of fun with it all right, so here we go with another poll time question. So this one is, since foraging is a natural behavior, birds will know how to do this intuitively and do not be, need to be taught. Is this true or is this false? Yes, awesome, you guys are so good at this. Absolutely false, looks like everyone is saying this is false. Yep, yep, that's not, not true. So you have to teach your birds. They're not gonna know if you just, throw a bunch of toys at them, they're gonna get scared and overwhelmed. <laughs> so um, start out small and encourage them, keep it positive. You know, they're so responsive to praise and when we, you know, get excited, they get excited. So read your bird's body language while you're teaching them to forage and, you know, take it at their pace because every bird has a different speed that they learn things. 
Here's some tips on foraging. So um, some things that you can do to teach your bird how to forage or some fun foraging activities you can engage them with are um, scattering food on the floor of the cage or the tabletop. You can attach food to branches and toys. Um, here is um, one of my birds. She's really enjoying um, that egg carton up there on the upper left. And there's some little treats hidden, you know, in there that she's sifting through. And there's some shredded paper in there. You can't quite see, but she had to lift off the shredded paper to get access to those. Um, and then down here, you can see that um, there's some pellets, you know, scattered around with little snacks. And there's a food bowl, a couple food bowls behind her, but she would much rather go to town on those scattered little treats everywhere um, than eat just out of the boring old bowl. Um, you can even see her, her eyes, her pupils are pinning a little bit. Birds do that when they're excited about something. Um, they can also do it when they're nervous, but in this case she was quite excited and quite into the act of foraging. So it, it can be really rewarding to engage in this with your birds and watch them open up and get so excited to do it. Um, and she unfortunately is a, a bird, you know, who is she came from a less than great situation so she um, has a lot of health issues and she does you know have a collar on her at times just to prevent her from mutilating her skin so if you're wondering why is my bird in a collar it's just a you know really the only way that we can keep her from picking at her skin um, on and off while managing some of her other health issues um, but i can promise you she's a very you know happy little bird and i'm just doing our best for her every day so um, as far as how to teach your bird to forage, here's something that you can start with. It's really basic. You take a piece of newspaper and you lay it over their food bowl and you just lift it up. Sometimes you have to lift it to show them, look, your food's still here, see? And then wait for them to go and lift the newspaper off themselves. And when they do, you want to praise them, get excited about it. Um, and then to try to make it a little more challenging, the next step is you can actually tape with masking tape around the outside of the bowl, put the newspaper on top and tape it. Um, when you do this, you often have to first make like a starter hole uh, to give the birds an idea that, look, you can see through this little hole, your food is still in there. You just have to get in there and work your little beak and chew through and then you can get access to your food. Um, but this is just something that's kind of simple. It doesn't take a lot of time and you can do this, you know, to give your birds um, more enrichment. It doesn't have to be complex. You know, there's lots of foraging toys out there that are complex and they're like puzzles and those are great, but it doesn't have to be that way, um, especially if you're short on time and you want to just make something real quick. You can um, stuff little pieces of paper in between the bars of their cage um, and then scrunch the paper around different snacks, little treats and things. Um, so this is my bird Wiley again, you know, having some fun chewing through that paper to try to get to her little piece of food. Another thing you can do is make a birdie lollipop. These are really fun and they're easy to do. You get a piece of um, paper, it can be newspaper, paper towel, um, napkin, and you put a snack in there. You can also do this with pellets. And then you wrap it up and you twist it so that you have a little handle there and then you hand it to your bird um, and they'll hold the little handle and chew at the, the ball with the little snacks in it. Um, and that one's pretty easy to do. Um, this one's also nice because it encourages that natural podomandibulation activity that I mentioned before, that natural behavior where a bird is holding something and eating it at the same time. Um, you can switch it up. You can keep things busy with, um, with your bird by switching up the types of toys in their environment as well as the types of foraging things. I'll actually make a toy bin, you know, when I have some downtime, I'll just sit there on the couch watching Netflix or whatever and I'll get together all my supplies, you know, like paper, cardboard, um, really stuff that you just disregard usually as trash um, can make great foraging toys as long as it's clean, of course. Um, and then just get creative and make stuff. And there's all kinds of things online if you want to look up how to make foraging items. Um, the AAV, which is the Association of Avian Veterinarians. I'm kind of blocking the logo, but there's the, the website there. You can check them out. They've got a lot of good resources for how to make foraging toys for your bird. All right. Um, 
So now we have some fun stuff. This is recipe time. I'm going to go over some recipes that I have just come up with um, for my birds that you know they seem to enjoy and hopefully your bird will too. Um, so these are very simple things. They shouldn't take you know more than a few minutes to make um, and we'll start with cinnamon berry oatmeal. So this oatmeal, um, you basically just bring water to a boil. You can start with about three quarters a cup of water, um, add a quarter cup of steel cut oats, and then once you add the oats, turn the dial down to low or medium heat. Then you wanna stir it occasionally for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, then you can add in berries, cinnamon stick. Um, you can really add any number of different berries. You can do strawberries, blueberries, um, any one of those. Um, and you don't have to add the cinnamon stick. That's just for fun if your bird likes cinnamon. Um, you want to cook for an additional five minutes after adding the goodies. And then this next part's really important. You want to remove it from heat and make sure it is totally cool before you give it to your birds. You don't want to give them warm things because warm things can actually stimulate hormonal behavior, which is not something that we want in captive birds. So um, make sure that it is cool. And then if you are already dealing with a bird who is um, having some unwanted hormonal behavior, probably best to just skip this recipe. Um, here's another recipe. It's called summer salad with sprouts. This one's pretty basic. Um, you can just chop, dice, shred, and peel pieces of your bird's favorite veggies. Um, and you can experiment with different shapes and sizes. As I mentioned before, sometimes birds will be picky depending on the shape of the food, not necessarily the taste. So you can try switching it up and dicing things or running it through a cheese grater, or just making different shapes and watching your bird to see which ones do they enjoy, which ones do they go for. Um, veggies can include bell pepper, broccoli, snow peas, zucchini, squash, jalapeno pepper, uh, dill, chia seed, and flax seed. You can sprinkle their favorite sprouts on top of them, and then you can serve it and watch them enjoy. So sprouting seeds, um, a note on sprouting seeds it is it can be quite good for them. I'm going to move this over here so you can actually read that. I'm not in your way. Sorry about that. <laughs> But when you soak and sprout seeds, um, it increases the bioavailability of nutrients in the seeds, um, but they are still seeds. So it's still you don't want it to be, you know, the majority of what they're eating, but can be a nice little treat. Um, some options for sprouting are mung beans, garbanzo beans, a whole bunch of stuff listed there. There are many different resources for sprouting seeds and actually Companion Parrots Rehomed has some great resources too. You can contact them um, to get some info on how to do it. Um, it's important to note that if you're going to sprout seeds and feed them to your birds, they should not smell. Smell the sprouts before you give them to your birds. And if they smell sour or yeasty, um, do not feed them to your birds because that is a sign that there could be fungal contamination or bacterial growth. So always smell them first and make sure there's, there's no smell to them. There's also some products out there like grapeseed extract and apple cider vinegar that you can rinse them with. Um, and there's a lot of information on how to do that. Um, so that's something you can do that will help prevent um, bacterial or mold growth. This is a mini pepper treasure chest. So this is just something I kind of came up with because um, I found my birds really like it a lot when I do this. You start with a mini bell pepper, uh, make holes in the bell pepper with a fork or a kebab skewer, and then you can fill the holes with little seeds or nuts, you know, small pieces, just as like a little treat. Um, another thing you can do is cut open an actual part of the bell pepper and then stuff it either with other veggies or little treats. Um, just kind of make them work for it so they have to chew through parts of the bell pepper to get to the goodies on the inside. This is a picture of what they look like. So you can see there's some sprouts in there, some steel cut oats. The one in the middle has some chia seeds sprinkled on top. Um, there's my bird Kiwi enjoying his, his little pepper treasure chest. This last recipe I'm going to go over is um, a veggie kebab. So these are really simple, basic, easy to do. You can start with either a pre-made toy or make your own. Um, but basically, you just start with something that is, you know, kind of straight and hanging from a string. And then you're going to weave in different vegetables to parts of it. So that can be, 
either in between the wooden slats. If you have little wooden blocks for them to chew on, you can also um, get these neat little plastic. They kind of look like wheels. You can see there's a slice of a radish stuck in between those little spokes of the wheel. So that's something that is a nice little holder for different types of veggies. Um, and you can use different veggies every day to keep your bird interested and offer variety. It is important that you make sure to show your bird how to do this first, because if you just hang it up in there, oftentimes they won't know that it's food on there. You have to show them and get them interested in it. Um, and then you don't want to leave it out for too long either. A general rule of thumb, you don't want to leave fruits or veggies out for more than eight hours or so, because they can start to grow mold or bacteria if left a little longer than that. And there's Wiley enjoying her little bell pepper on her kebab. And that concludes my presentation. So I want to thank you all so, so much for taking time out of your day to come to this presentation. Um, and I want to thank Companion Parrots Rehomed for hosting this. Um, I really, I hope that, I know this was a long talk, but I hope there was something in here that you learned, something new you hadn't heard of before. Um, and I will be going over um, some question and answers in just a little bit. Um, these are my references for the studies that I mentioned. Um, and so here um, we have some other questions. So I'll start with these questions that I received before, um, before the talk today, and then I'll also open it up at the end for any additional questions. All right. So the first question is, how can I, ident I identify a good brand of parrot chow? Um, so parrot chow, I'm assuming you mean pellets. Um, so parrot pellets, um, ideally you want to check, you know, that research the company a little bit. See, have they been around for a while? Do they have um, an avian veterinarian on staff who helped formulate this? Because unfortunately, in this day and age, really anyone can make a bird food, put their name on it, say it's good for birds, and sell it, um, which is scary. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there, so you want to make sure what you're giving your bird is actually what they need. Um, so ideally, if they have someone on staff who knows about avian nutrition and avian veterinarian, that's best. Um, and then if it's been around a long time and also if they're doing quality control testing of the product, that's basically where they look at the, they take packages out periodically and they test it to make sure that what they put on the package is actually what you're getting. Um, so that's really the, the best information I can give to identify a good brand. I know there's so many out there and it can get so confusing um, to choose. So the next question is, how do I get my birds to eat their fruits and veggies? That is a very good question and it's hard, right? It's, it's frustrating because we know it's good for them. And sometimes you'll go through all that effort, make them this gorgeous salad and they don't want anything to do with it. So that's, that's not uncommon that that will happen. And really the main thing I would encourage you is just to um, don't give up, be patient um, and watch your birds to see, you know, don't just like leave a salad in there and walk away. Watch them and see which ones are they going after, which ones are they ignoring. Um, and you can try to incorporate the ones that they seem to pick out, you know, a little more than others. And there's so many different options for what you can offer them. Um, you can really just try a little bit of new things, you know, every few days and see what they like. Um, the next question was, I have a fairly inactive blue front Amazon and would love to understand if new yellow feathers are a sign of nutritional issues or even beginning fatty liver disease. So I can't say for sure what that could be a sign of. It can be so many different things when a bird's plumage suddenly changes an abnormal color. But what I would recommend is bringing them into your avian vet and getting them checked out, um, you know, potentially doing some blood work to see, you know, what could be going on there. Um, the next question was benefits of apple cider vinegar and dilution ratio or frequency to add to the water. So um, benefits of apple cider vinegar, um, it is great. It is a great, great product. Um, and you wanna make sure that if you're given apple cider vinegar, it's one that's called uh, with mother because mother is like the pulp and all the goodies in there that has probiotics and all that good stuff. Um, but there are some antibacterial and antifungal properties to apple cider vinegar. So the main reason that I use it is um, to rinse veggies. Um, you can definitely rinse your veggies with it before feeding them to your birds. Um, you just want to make a dilution, um, you know, of it so it's not super strong and super, you know, if they taste it, sometimes they won't be into what you're trying to feed them. 
Um, and then you can also, um, there's various things that we use it for um, in the clinic, you know, for various health conditions. That being said, I would not recommend adding it to their water um, for any, you know, reason unless it's specifically recommended by your vet. Okay, so best diet for budgies with heart and liver problems or a canary with liver problems, herbs or other supplements. So for budgies with heart and liver problems, you know, really you want to make sure that you're focusing on the fat content and reducing it, you know, as much as possible. You want to make sure you're not giving them too many seeds. Less than 10% is ideal. Um, but if you have a sick bird, you don't want to change their diet suddenly. That can get them very sick and in a much worse place. So before making any dietary changes, always, always, always consult your avian vet um, who's examined your bird, is familiar with their health and their conditions and can advise you, you know, how to proceed with that. Um, as far as herbs or other supplements, it's there's so many out there. I can't just kind of blanketly recommend any one of them because it's going to depend on your individual bird. So I'd recommend, you know, working closely with your avian vet to see what works best there. Um, what is the appropriate amount of fruits for green sheet conures? Um, ideally, you know, for green sheet conures and um, really a lot of our parrots, we want it to be, you know, smaller, I'd say less than the amount of vegetables that they're eating. Um, so really you want to make sure veggies are kind of, you know, a bigger part of it. Um, and then fruits, you can still feed these guys fruits, but you just don't want it to be the only thing they're eating. Like you don't want to give them, you know, a bowl full of apple slices or something like that. But if you're mixing in some chop, and you want to throw a couple of blueberries in there, you know, that's OK. Uh, next question is, which blood work test should I request to get the best insight into my bird's health as impacted by diet? That's a really good question. So there's a lot of different types of blood work we can run on birds. Um, the basic type of blood test is called a CBC and chemistry panel. So that gives you information on the red and white blood cells, on liver function, kidney function, electrolytes, all kinds of different things. Um, so that's kind of like your basic starter type of blood work. Um, but there are so many different things. So I, I'd recommend chatting with your vet and seeing what they would recommend. Concerns of illness that could spread from other animals, for example, chickens. Um, yes, there are lots of illnesses that chickens can give to parrots, so I wouldn't recommend cohabitating them or keeping them, you know, in close vicinity with one another. Um, just in terms of the risks of illness, they can pass back and forth. Um, also, I'm trying to find the perfect pellet and seed combo in addition to chop. It's so hard to choose with all the brands, etc. I agree. It is so hard to choose with all the brands out there. It gets overwhelming, right? So um, I'll tell you, I switch it up on my birds, you know, a lot of the time because they'll be stubborn and just like little kids, their favorite thing one day isn't their favorite thing, you know, the next. So um, I'll go through a lot of different pellets and try mixing different things. Um, in general, there's a few that, you know, I stick with, um, but every now and then I'm finding I have to switch it up for them. Um, as far as the perfect seed combo, um, when it comes to seeds, unfortunately, if you're comparing different brands of seeds, it's kind of like comparing chocolate cake to red velvet cake. It's still cake at the end of the day. And, um, you know, you just really don't want it to be a large part of their diet. So um, I don't know that there's necessarily one brand that I would recommend over another for with regards to that. Um, my parakeet's beak needs to be trimmed by the vet each month. Is there anything dietary I could provide to help her avoid this unusual growth? Um, unfortunately, nothing that I know of dietary wise that will specifically help with that. There's a lot of reasons that bird's beaks will overgrown. Um, will overgrow. So I, I would encourage you to ask your vet about that for her particular case, his or her. Um, how do I form nutrition plans for bird patients to lose or maintain weight? There are many pellets and commercial diets that do not have KCAL information. Yep, KCALs are amount of calories and food. Um, so also what can be done to lower triglyceride levels? So as far as how do you make um, nutrition plans for bird patients, um, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm wondering this question, it sounds like it came from another veterinarian. Um, so it's tough, right? It depends on a lot of different things. It depends on the species. 
Um, are they underweight or overweight? Um, it sounds like in this case you want them to lose or potentially maintain weight. So I go with, you know, um, looking at their body condition, you know, how large or not large are their pectoral muscles and other muscles? Do they have subcutaneous fat deposits? Um,